Hey, what's going on guys? Ben Brewster here, Tri Athletics. Uh, today I want to touch on uh, velocity fluctuations. So obviously it's super frustrating um, where one day you'll have your, your best stuff, your A stuff, and the next day you'll have uh, what I call your C stuff and your, your velo is down a few miles an hour and you're like, what the hell, what's going on? Um, super common. Um, this is not just you who it affects, this affects every pitcher. Um, however, there are ways that we can hopefully try to minimize these fluctuations and control as many of the variables that we can control as possible. There are going to be things that are out of your control and that fluctuation is normal. However, when I think about someone like a Craig Kimbrell or a Jacob deGrom, like they pretty much have within a certain error margin their, their certain stuff from outing to outing. So uh, the guys at the very top have found a way to be really consistent in their routines and really consistent in their mechanics and all these different variables that they can control. Uh, which is why, at least from an out and outing standpoint, over the course of a season, maybe not over the course of their entire career, um, but their velocity and their stuff will typically be relatively consistent at these higher levels. You don't see that nearly as much at the lower levels, at the high school level, especially at the youth level, um, because there's a lot more kind of constant variables changing. Um, but I want to go through this thread that I put out on Twitter a while back uh, and just kind of share this with you guys on YouTube as well. Um, so again, you're not going to have your A-plus stuff every single outing, but some pitchers will experience more drastic uh, fluctuations in velo than others. Um, so again, what are the top reasons? Uh, first one is cumulative throwing fatigue. Um, these aren't necessarily in any specific order. Um, this is just kind of the list that I had through, through the Twitter thread, but cumulative throwing fatigue. So uh, managing throwing, work, throwing workload is a delicate balance. Um, too little will lead to undertraining. So if you throw once a week on the day of your start and you don't throw the rest of the week, right, that is undertraining. That's not going to optimally prepare you. Um, but too much leads to overtraining and fatigue on game day. Uh, so the, just keep this in mind. Um, this workload, it does include warm up throws. It does include any sort of plyo throws you're doing pregame. It does include the pregame bullpen. It does include your warm up pitches uh, before every inning uh, throughout the course of an outing. So if your velo is fluctuating a ton, really take a hard look at your overall throwing workload and see, hey, over the course of the week, like how many throws am I making? What type of intensity? Is there anywhere that I might be doing too much where I might need to back off a little bit from here or there? Um, and that can make a huge difference at times. So this is the most common reason why velocity will dip in season. And is usually, in my experience, from a pitcher doing too much on their quote unquote recovery days um, outside of their game pitches. In other words, it's not usually from the actual uh, pitches that you're throwing in the game, right? Everyone's monitoring pitch counts and, you know, for the most part, like college coaches, pro coaches aren't having guys go out there and throw 100 pitches, you know, or way over 100 pitches, right? They're not having guys throw 150 pitches or anything like that. So that's not where the excessive workload usually happens from anymore because there's so much uh, kind of focus on the actual game competitive pitches. It's on these other areas. So take a look at your recovery days. Um, a lot of times there's this perception that, hey, I have to throw everything hard all the time if I want to throw hard. And there's some truth to consistently throwing hard multiple times a week, um, but you don't have to turn your recovery days into hybrid days and your hybrid days into velocity days and certainly not in season. Um, and so if you can back off and think of your recovery days as like, this is a time to take your arm for a walk, just get it moving, get the range of motion going um, and just try to help put some blood into the arm, like that's a good mentality to go into a recovery day with versus a like, hey, I'm gonna do a little more than I know I probably should and just what I can barely get away with. Um, and so there's this difference between maximum recoverable volume, all right, we're barely towing the line between what I can possibly recover from in time for the next outing and minimum effective dose. Like what's the, uh, kind of what's that area where it's just enough to maintain the feel of everything in between outings. And so you're gonna be somewhere in between that range, um, but just taking a step back. Some I've, I've noticed some people don't actually um, seem to think that plyos count as throwing. Like they don't, for some reason, they don't, just cause it's not baseball, they don't think of plyos as throwing. Plyos is absolutely throwing. And if you're doing 30 throws and plyos at 20% effort, that's completely different than the guy that's doing 100 throws or 200 throws of plyos at 75, 80% effort. It's a completely different level of fatigue that they're going to be inducing, and that's going to potentially contribute to velocity fluctuations. Number two, cumulative lifting fatigue. Um, so certainly, if you aren't training or lifting in season, you should be. I think we're all pretty much aware of that, familiar with that. Strength matters, power matters, and you have to do something to maintain it in season. Um, however, failure to train will lead to drop-offs by the end of the season. Um, so the guys that don't listen to that, obviously, like 
they can get away with it for a while, um, but ultimately that will catch up to them. So you should be lifting in season. Uh, but the point is that this is a balance to strike and a balance to have to uh, be able to maintain. So you can't necessarily overdo what you're doing in season, but you still have to do something enough just to maintain or at least somewhat maintain so that you don't lose 10, 15 pounds by the end of the season. Your strength numbers aren't all down 20% going into the playoffs, going into the end of the year when it actually really, really matters. Um, so case in point, as most of us know, like excess volumes will do more harm than good in season. The key is to do just enough to maintain your strength levels, but no more. I already touched on the minimum, minimum effective dose concept for uh, throwing fatigue and throwing workload. Um, but the issue is when you have either an overzealous uh, pitcher who really loves the weight room and maybe the weight room was like a big turning point for them and like how they got from 80 to 90 miles an hour and like they're really bought in and that's great. Um, but you also need to realize it's actually fairly easy to maintain your strength in season and it doesn't require doing nearly as much as you think you might need to do. So usually it's overzealous pitchers and some of them are honestly trying to make further strength gains in season, which again, I get it because I was that way freshman year in college i was that way through high school like i thought i could just have it all i thought i could be fresh for every outing and just completely hammer it hard every single lift and not have to nothing had to give in season the fact of the matter is that's not the time to be trying to push strength gains unless you're very very new to lifting you're not going to be gaining strength in season unless you're doing volumes that are frankly too much for what you should be trying to do uh, in season if that is truly your focus there are some exceptions to this so if you're playing summer ball and you have like a great setup where maybe you can throw live an year or two every Saturday and maybe you can really focus on your strength work from Monday through Thursday and still be in a place where you're fully recovered for that Saturday outing. Right? We've, we've orchestrated balancing acts where you can get kind of the best of both worlds um, with kind of summer ball scenarios or throwing live at our facility and then training the rest of the week um, and still being fully recovered. It's possible. Um, but if you're in like a spring college season where that season needs to be your main focus or you're a pro guy in your pro season, that needs to be your main focus. Um, just don't let this uh, excess focus on strength or on the lifting side of the equation get in the way. So take a closer look at what you're doing from a lifting standpoint. Is this as really kind of minimum effective dose or am I kind of exceeding what I need to be doing? We've switched our mentality a little bit in recent years from um, just lifting low volume and just doing the minimum to we can still minimize soreness and you know keep the volume down but still get something out of it from more of like power and speed focus um, so here i put you know in general uh, rule of thumb like if, if you let's say do four sets of eight on a movement in the off season or three sets of six in the off season uh, cutting the total number of sets in half that will cut the total volume total number of sets total number of reps of everything you're doing in half so four sets of eight becomes two sets of eight in season. Three sets of six becomes one to two sets of six in season. And you might be thinking like, what am I gonna get out of one set of six on like a squat? And the answer is actually surprisingly, like you can get a lot out of one set of six, certainly enough to just stimulate your muscles, stimulate your central nervous system to, hey, let's maintain this strength, this muscle mass that I've built. So building up to one heavy set and then moving on actually can work, believe it or not. It just seems kind of laughably low volume to somebody that's really kind of a meathead and really enjoys getting after it in the weight room and has really bought into that. Um, in season, we'll typically use two to three sessions a week, again, cutting the volume in half. Um, and then we have a free uh, in season training plan that you guys can check out on our website as well. The next thing is caloric balance. Um, so making sure that you are uh, you know, your nutrition isn't just fluctuating all over the place, out into outing over the course of the season as you're on the road, as you're staying in hotels, right? It does become difficult, but you have to be able to maintain your weight uh, and strength. And it's not just about the training side. We've already addressed the training side, not doing too much, but also not doing nothing. Um, maintaining your body weight, maintaining your muscle mass. The other side of that equation is uh, getting enough calories and getting enough protein. In general, getting enough protein is not gonna be an issue as long as you're getting some sort of protein source with each meal. Um, you're probably gonna be okay on the protein set standpoint, going for about a gram per pound of body weight of protein per day. Um, but a lot of players struggle to get sufficient calories in season, uh, which makes it tough to hold on to the muscle mass, hold on to the strength that they work so hard to gain in the off season. Now the reason is obviously now you're at the field for four to six to eight hours a day. Uh, while you're at the field, like maybe you're having a meal at the very front end, maybe after the game you're having a meal, uh, but there's a big window in there where a lot of athletes just aren't getting calories in, but they're burning a lot of calories. So you may be burning an extra thousand calories a day, 
but now there's a huge gap in the middle of the day where you're not eating anything. So you have to make up for that now in these like really abbreviated windows. Like after 10 p.m., you need to get a bunch of calories in before bed after the game. And you also need to, you know, maybe you wake up kind of late and you have a few hours before you have to get to the field or maybe you're running around to class all day. And so now you're having to get 4,000, maybe 5,000 calories depending on the athlete um, and depending how fast their metabolism is in this, these very abbreviated windows. So case in point, you might, if you find yourself struggling to keep on weight in season, the answer isn't just to come into spring training, like, or come into uh, the start of the season, like 20 pounds overweight and like sloppy and bad body composition. The answer is you come in with a plan for how am I gonna get an extra 500 to 1,000 calories a day in me in season and actually do that in a sustainable way. And so our athletes, by and large, like don't, don't lose weight in season. And if they start to kind of drop a couple pounds because we're monitoring everything, and we're in communication, like we can make that adjustment to their caloric intake pretty quickly and find a way to uh, not allow that to get any further along than it needs to be. So how do I get 500 to 1,000 calories extra a day? Typically the best way to do that is actually while you're at the field. Now, not eating whole plates of pasta like during the game, nothing like that, but peanut butter sandwich, like before you walk out to shag batting practice, um, you know, a granola bar, half a granola bar, like, early on in the game, if you're a relief pitcher, um, you know, a couple handfuls of trail mix throughout the day while you're at the field. Some things like that are very, very simple and can go a long way towards overall just preventing that gradual weight loss that a lot of athletes deal with over the course of the season. Again, we have a free weight gain program. You guys can check it on our website as well if you, if you want some more information. Um, number four is weather and temperature. Kind of self-explanatory goes without saying, but you know, if it's 25, 30 degrees outside, if it's 105 degrees, if it's super windy and wind's blowing in your face, if it's raining, uh, you know, sideways, these are all gonna have impacts on performance, impacts on velocity. Like, don't be surprised if that impact, if you're down three miles an hour on a day when it's 30 degrees outside, right? We all know this, but like in the moment when you have a frustrating outing and you can't figure out why your velocity is fluctuating, why it's down, why you had a bad day, you slept well, you did everything you could. Like sometimes it comes, it comes down to these things that are outside of our control. Um, this goes hand in hand with number five, uh, mound conditions and specs, right? If it's, uh, you know, it's raining, the mound's muddy, uh, there's a huge hole in the mound, um, the mound is really flat, there's all sorts of things from that standpoint that really have an impact, right? And just how big of an impact, like how many guys can throw just as hard on flat ground as they can on the mound? Right, I'm good, I'm relatively very good at throwing on flat ground, I've thrown 97 on flat ground, 98 on the mound, so I only have a one mile an hour gap there. A lot of guys, it's like a five mile an hour gap. But you know, even I throw harder on the mound. Most guys, it's five plus miles an hour, three to five plus miles an hour harder that they throw on the mound. So what happens when you have a mound that's a few inches lower than it should be, or really dug out or a huge hole? Um, it can certainly be a big role as mounds vary so much outing to outing, um, certainly at the high school level, certainly at the youth level, uh, but even at the professional level, like lower, lower levels of professional level, occasionally you'll see that uh, mounds become an issue. Um, I think I mentioned this in, the, in this thread. Um, so I had one outing where the mound was totally dug out uh, by the time I actually got in the game from this, the opposing team starter. Um, and I usually like to throw on the first base side of the rubber. And so I had to actually, it was so bad that I couldn't even consider throwing in that. Like my foot was complete, would completely be inside the hole and I would be spraining my ankle or something if I tried to throw in that. So I had to move to the other side of the rubber. It was completely foreign. I was down, I think, three to five miles an hour that game, like no idea where the ball was going, like find a way to fight through it. Um, now I could have freaked out. I could have said, why is my velo fluctuating? Like what's wrong with me? Um, or I could just realize like, hey, that was out of my control. I did the best I could with what I had. And again, the next outing, the normal mound, my stuff was back to normal. So um, kind of the big picture point of this video is let's control as many of the things we can control. Certain things are going to be outside of our control and that's just is is what it is you're gonna to have to deal with it as best you can but freaking out is not the answer and that's what a lot of that's what the natural reaction is going to be when you normally throw 93 and you have an outing where you're nine, throwing 90 and you feel like you just backpedaled two years of progress it's usually not the case there's usually an explanation for it go through this list of things that we're going to be covering and figure out which of these things can we address moving forward um, so I also put kind of a side note here um, when it comes to uh, the mound and velocity fluctuations. Um, one thing that I've seen is that high slot north-south guys, I think about like Ferris wheel versus merry-go-round as far as like really over the top guys. 
I always think of like Tim Lincecum, or you can think of like an Ian Anderson, James Karinczak, really over the top north south guys. Um, they tend to really need to utilize that plane and they tend to benefit more from steep mounds and be hurt more from flat mounds. So in other words, like they will typically throw very poorly on flat ground relative to how well they throw on the mound. They might have a five, six, eight mile an hour bump when they get on the mound versus how uh, they're not able to really utilize their mechanics as well on flat ground. And then the flip side, guys who are more east-west, rotational, Randy Johnson, like myself, um, typically can still find a way to be on time and rotate fairly effectively on flat ground and on slightly uh, slightly lower mounds and they don't benefit nearly as much from these steep mounds. So just something to kind of keep in mind if you're an east-west guy and you just had a down day because you threw on a super steep mound and kind of threw off your mechanics or you're a north-south guy and you had a really good day where you're up four miles an hour, two miles an hour, whatever, um, from the steep mound, just realize that certainly can play a role as well, the steepness of the mound. So that was kind of the first part from the first thread. Um, the second piece of this uh, to get into is time of day would be the next big one. So there is evidence and kind of consistent evidence that uh, time of day can certainly play a role in power production. And again, across sports, across activities, but like our body is not necessarily in its prime state early in the morning. So where is this relevant? Well, it's relevant if you're in high school and you're playing in a showcase tournament at 10 a.m. It's relevant if you're in spring training and you're playing on a backfield game uh, or throwing a live batting practice at 9 a.m. and you just woke up at 7.30 a.m. or 7 a.m. Uh, it's, it's just relevant from that standpoint. It's relevant if you're throwing a bullpen early in the morning in a pro off season. Um, I know for me personally, typically, I'm gonna be down about two to three miles an hour and that's typically, again, what we'll see with our uh, athletes when they're doing any sort of velocity testing bullpen type work in like the first several hours uh, after waking. So this particular study that I mentioned in the video or that I linked in the video, um, just again one example and this this was just looking at one explanation for why that could be uh, maybe linked to core body temperature and power, uh, lower body power output. Uh, so essentially in those kind of first hours after waking like co your core body temperature is not fully elevated uh, to you know, to normal, to baseline, um, you know, until several hours after waking. So that's one potential explanation for why uh, power outputs are typically down a couple percent or a few percent um, kind of in those early, early morning hours. Now, this can be, uh, you can train this. So if you kind of slowly adjust your circadian rhythm, start going to bed earlier, leading into spring training, start waking up earlier, you can counteract this effect to some extent. But again, typically those power output numbers the ideal time to be uh, to be throwing from a velo standpoint is obviously going to be in the afternoon to kind of evening ranges uh, when you're kind of in this fully alert um, nervous system state. So again, just worth noting, like if you're down a few miles an hour and it's a morning bullpen, morning game, whatever, completely normal for almost everybody that I've ever seen. And this takes us into uh, this physiological arousal and caffeine standpoint. Um, and again, caffeine put that here in this one because it is. It is linked intricately to uh, the level of arousal, but arousal is again impacted by a lot of things. Uh, how many f you know fans are in the stands? Did you? I know for me, like when I was pitching in rookie ball games, like there's nobody there. Like you're throwing in the morning, like you do not have the same level of adrenaline or physiological arousal as you know pitching in a game where you have you know college uh, like playoff game where you have like 10,000 fans there. It's just a totally different level of arousal with depending on the game situation you come in bases loaded in a jam or you're uh, you know just going into a game it's the first inning nobody out uh, you know against a midweek team in college just a lot of different factors that are going to affect arousal but in general higher arousal will kick us towards a high adrenaline uh, fight or flight state and this will potentially increase performance there's a lot of uh, a lot of things that link to increased performance with being in this high arousal state um, However, I say potentially because getting too amped up can actually reduce performance in a skill sport like pitching. So if it's something like powerlifting, where it's all the way on this extreme end of the spectrum, you want to be as amped up as you possibly can be. You want someone slapping you in the back. You want a smelling salt. You want as much possible adrenaline and central nervous system, sympathetic uh, nervous system activation as you possibly can uh, for something like that. But let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum. Let's go to a sport like marksmanship 
where you really have to be able to focus. You have to be able to calm yourself. And it's much more in kind of this, this fine-tuned, dexterous uh, type skill. You don't want to have just pounded 17 Red Bulls and have someone slap you in the face uh, in something like marksmanship. Now, where does pitching fall in that spectrum? Well, it's, it's a blend. And most sports are a blend of you want some level of arousal, but there's such a thing as over arousal. So this is the uh, arousal bell curve. This is, you've probably seen this before. Uh, if you've taken any sort of exercise science classes or anything like that. Um, but essentially there's a sweet spot somewhere in the middle where you have, you're, you're amped up, but you're not so amped up that it starts to negatively affect you. How do we find that sweet spot? And so that really is the balance uh, for a lot of pitchers is over the course of their career, you're not gonna know at 13 years old, 15 years old, like how to get to that sweet spot or even what that sweet spot is. So I think I mentioned a couple a couple guys here. So um, think of like Mad, uh, Mad Max, like Max Scherzer versus Corey Kluber. Like they don't have the same level of aggression and intensity when they're pitching. They're very different personalities when they're on the mound, but I can almost guarantee you that that, that level, that sweet spot for them is gonna be different. So Max Scherzer is gonna be probably further along on the amped up, uh, you know, aggressive, I'm gonna like I'm gonna kill you side of the spectrum, where he needs to have that like that aggression. He might benefit more from a cup of coffee, whereas Corey Kluber, he's more of a precision tactician, uh, command guy, right? He tends to be, and again, just uh, kind of anecdotally and just from a kind of observation from the outside, he tends to be more on kind of the the lower arousal end of the spectrum. And so you need to spend some time and kind of figure out where do I actually perform the best? And it's not necessarily only about velocity. It's like, where do I have that blend of command while also velocity, while also arousal, while also you know being able to repeat this and consistently get into that state. If you need to have two Red Bulls, three Red Bulls, like a crazy amount of caffeine, a crazy amount of all this stuff just to get in a state where you can go and be uh, competitive, how realistic is that? Now, if it's like just have a cup of coffee before the game and that really does help a little bit and you don't have your hands don't shake anything like that, um, you know, finding where that balance is for you, where it's still a realistic kind of routine that you can, you know, use on a fairly regular basis, regardless of if it's a morning game, afternoon game, evening game, you'll still be able to get into that state. And that is what a lot of the very, very best professional players have learned over time and they learn later on in their careers is how to consistently get in that same state of arousal for optimal performance. Number eight would be sleep quality and travel. Again, super obvious one, but guys will go on bus trips, have poor nights of sleep, have a game where their stuff is not there, and then wonder what is wrong with them and think they're broken and start changing their mechanics, start changing their arm slots, start shortening their arm action, you know, potentially have a injury, flexor strain, something like that. It's actually just from poor recovery, um, but not realize that there's really a connection here. So taking a step back, sleep quality and travel can be a big uh, variable in VLA fluctuations. Um, so these, all these sorts of things that go hand in hand with more so pro baseball and you call like college summer ball, like Northwoods league, um, these long bus trips, this travel, it will certainly have a very measurable effect on performance. Um, ton of research on sleep quality and sleep extension and sleep in general and sports performance that can be extrapolated to pitching. Don't be surprised if you're down a couple ticks after a night or two of poor sleep or just kind of a regular sleep where you don't have that consistent circadian rhythm. Um, so a couple of tips here, um, you know, just basic sleep hygiene stuff. Uh, try to avoid using sleep aids, obviously alcohol, if you're a college pro guy, like alcohol actually doesn't help your sleep quality, even if it might help you feel like you fall asleep faster. Um, you know, things like zinc, magnesium, uh, you know, glycine, uh, there's there's other types of supplements that can help with actually falling asleep a little bit faster um, without actually disturbing the quality of your sleep uh, like alcohol does. Um, shooting for eight to 10 hours, um, the more the better in general. There have been studies on uh, free throw shooting accuracy in basketball players and sleep extension. And they saw a 9% increase in shooting accuracy uh, when these players were instructed to sleep uh, as much as they possibly could. So that's pretty striking, right? The, the not just talking about power output here and velocity, but being able to extend your sleep, having a 9%, like what if you could go from 55% strikes to 64% strikes in a game from baseline, just from sleeping more, like that's goes from mediocre to like very good. Um, so that can be a potentially big role. Um, additional tips, like trying to avoid a super high caffeine intake uh, for night games. Again, I've, you know, Clay Holmes, one example, like he, he has a cup of coffee, um, you know, pre-outing and you're 
if that's what works for you, like it's, there's gonna be some impact on sleep. There just is, is gonna be some sort of unavoidable uh, aspect to that. If that's what you need to be at your absolute best for a night game, it's gonna impact your sleep to some extent. We just need to minimize these other variables as much as we possibly can. Uh, pay attention to sleep hygiene, uh, reducing uh, blue, you know, blue light, screen time before bed, blackout curtains, keeping the room cool. Like there's a ton of different uh, resources out there to learn about sleep hygiene. But all that stuff combined can definitely make a measurable impact on your ability to fall asleep and stay asleep. Um, we talked about zinc and magnesium. There's some other supplements that uh, if you guys are interested, I can do, do a post about that in the future. Some of the things that I take. Um, consider investing a whoop strap or an Ura ring just to get some kind of objective metrics on your sleep. Uh, again, you don't want to be overly obsessive about those numbers and start using that as a crutch. So if you kind of see that you have a poor recovery day and you have a start later that day it's not something to say like well i can't i just can't start i can't throw it today like my life is over i need to just wait till i have a perfect recovery to, to pitch things aren't always going to be perfect but just using those as ways to over time see the trends in your recovery see if i start in introducing these supplements or introducing the sleep hygiene do my recovery scores start to trend better over time that's really how i would recommend using uh, some of these products uh, fluctuations in mobility. This will be the next one. So uh, after pitching, right, pitching very, is a very stressful act on our body, very explosive. Um, it's going to involve a lot of eccentric stress on certain muscles, uh, particularly the muscles that are involved in uh, kind of eccentric uh, decelerative component of pitching. Uh, and, and again, the muscles involved in the acceleration phase. So your tissues are going to recover in a a little bit of a shortened, toned up state, right? If you go rip 10 sets of 10 bench press and the next day, like you're not gonna expect to have complete full range of motion. You're gonna feel like you're a little bit limited because your muscles are healing in a shortened, toned up state, right? That's normal, that's, that's how we heal. Um, but this can over time show up as temporary lost uh, shoulder internal rotation and adduction, uh, supination. So as your, your pronator, and pronator flexor start to get overworked, you can start to lose supination, shoulder flexion. As the lat starts to work again really hard while you're pitching, you're gonna have some soreness in your lat in, in general uh, next day for 48 hours, 72 hours, something like that. So shoulder flexion can get limited over time and the scapula can start to get into some bad positions. Uh, and then horizontal uh, abduction. So I already gave you the bench press example for, for the pec. Um, so again, the next day after you throw, you're gonna feel kind of tight, you're gonna feel sore that's normal it's just if we never address tissue quality in our flexor never address lat tissue quality or lat length never address any of these things then over the course of years this starts to build up so some basic uh, post throwing routine stuff some basic kind of uh, mobility stuff and tissue stuff on kind of your off days or those in between days simple routine simple movement flow stuff uh, that we give our athletes can make a big difference just having a very very basic uh, mobility routine that you go through just to make sure you're kind of hitting all the just all the check boxes and making sure that uh, everything is recovering back to where it needs to be getting back to baseline uh, for that next bullpen and then for that next start or the next outing so here will be an example of uh, one pitcher i've posted this before in other q a's and uh, in other other posts but uh, just one example he, this is a lefty and you can see his uh his left arm is significantly limited in supination compared to what he naturally has in his right arm and so, I mean, this is probably 35, 40 degree difference in uh, lost supination. Now, some of this can be potentially beneficial, potentially protective, right? We don't wanna be hypermobile in every joint in our body as a pitcher, um, but we also don't want to let those adaptations get to a point where they can potentially become dysfunctional. So this is a guy that we, you know, we took a closer look. We noticed this in the, in the supination screen and part of his assessment. So I took a closer look, like what is the, level of uh, kind of tone and, and are there any issues through the pronator, or any issues through the forearm? And in his case, there were. And so we can address some of that with some different mobility type exercises and start to restore some of that. Even though the goal may not be to fully get back to this level, it's let's just make sure the tissues are taken care of and that we're not letting things get too out of hand um, through the adaptations and the asymmetries that happen as a result of pitching. Uh, I believe there's a couple left, two or three left. The next one will be inconsistent throwing focus. So if you're constantly changing what your focus is day to day, um, you're certainly gonna have velo fluctuations as a result of that. So this is an often overlooked factor. Um, so maybe one day it's like, I'm just gonna go out there and try to hit 95. But then the next day it's, well, my pitching coach talked to me about like 
uh, you know, executing my slider down and away. So the next day you went to that outing with a focus on that. And the next day you went to it with a focus on your uh, lead leg block and the next day. And so the guys who are constantly changing things in season, don't be surprised that the velocity is always changing as well. If, if everything, all these variables are changing all the time in what your, your focus is and, and your mechanics, um, it's certainly going to show up in terms of velocity and consistency as well. Um, so again, very hard to consistently produce your best fastball if you only allowed it yourself to focus on your best fastball when you think it matters, like on, for example, a scout day or on a velocity bullpen or on O2 fastballs um, when you're ahead in the game and you're feeling comfortable and you actually truly let that one go. Um, so just making sure like whatever state you get yourself into where you find that you can consistently repeat your mechanics and have your best stuff, it's about trying to as closely replicate that those that recipe, those ingredients to, to produce that recipe for optimal performance. I'm giving you a whole list of items, a whole list of ingredients. Let's see if we can check off as many boxes as possible each outing to get yourself into that consistent state. Mechanical, mechanical repeatability goes hand in hand with this. So more prevalent in like in youth high school pitchers um, where the mechanics are all over the place. If your landing spot's changing, your, your arm slot's changing, your hip shoulder separation's changing, um, you're playing with different things all the time, or even if your focus is the same, but like you just don't have very good body control, um, don't have very good strength, very good stability, and your mechanics are just fluctuating a lot uh, pitch to pitch, the velocity is gonna be fluctuating a lot pitch to pitch as well, and outing to outing. So making major kind of mechanical overhaul changes in season is, is probably a mistake. And if you're trying to do that, you're trying to shorten your arm path, you're trying to drastically change your leg lift, right? You're trying to do these things in season, you're gonna see some of that start to creep up and creep in to your actual performance to some of these velocity numbers. Um, my take on this is like, if you're going to improve your mechanical repeatability in season, I wouldn't be focusing as much in general on the gross patterns on trying to change your leg lift, on trying to change your landing position, on trying to change this or that. Um, there can be a time and place to work on that in your kind of bullpen sessions in season, but the lowest hanging fruit tends to be just focusing on routines. I've harped on this before, but if you don't have a pregame routine where you can go and tell somebody exactly what your pregame routine is and like write it out, uh, if you don't have a pre-outing routine, uh, like a uh, bullpen routine, so like what do I do like the morning of a start? Like, what am I eating for breakfast? What am I getting up? Uh, when do I get to the field? Um, once I actually get to the game, what is my warm-up routine? What is my plyo routine if I'm doing one? Am I long tossing? How many throws? Uh, what do I do when I actually get on the mound pre-game for my pre-game bullpen? How many throws? Am I establishing the fastball outside, then inside, then going to my curveball? You should be able to map out exactly what you're doing the entire time, and this is what the very best pitchers in the, in the world are doing and have been doing for a long time. They have so much consistency in everything that they're doing that there aren't variables constantly changing. And then probably the most important one, pre-pitch routine. So what are you doing pre-pitch to help refocus? Um, and again, this is way more performance than just velocity. This is consistency of velocity, but also consistency of commanding the ball, consistency of, hey, if I just gave up a two-run bomb, like how do I go back to my pre-pitch routine and use that as an anchor to consistently get in the same mental state for the next pitch? Consistently getting in the same mental state each pitch is going to allow you to more consistently replicate your mechanics, which is going to allow you to more consistently uh, produce that kind of A plus stuff relative to what you're capable of doing. So the body follows the mind. These routines are your mental anchor as the game shifts around you. Again, great quote about Corey Kluber. Um, this was uh, Mickey Calloway on him. He has that ability to not get rattled, probably because of his in-between uh, pitch routine. Watch him, it resets everything. He rubs the ball in exactly the same spot between each pitch, between the seams, then he lowers his eyes. You ever see that Geico commercial with the Cowboys? They're in the bar, the sheriff is looking down and then shows his eyes real slow. Corey does that. He looks up and locks in on the target. It's the last thing he does and he does it every time. And so this is an example where like, maybe he just subconsciously does that, but this is something we worked on in college uh, where we worked on our routines and we actually wrote out how am I gonna come set on the rubber? Where am I coming set on the rubber? When do I take the sign? Where are my eyes? What, is, what am I doing with my breath? When do I take that breath? What am I thinking about with that breath? Is there a keyword that I can link to that breath? I would encourage you to take the time to write out that pre-pitch routine and then actually practice it five minutes a day. Practice it during batting practice when you're just out in the outfield shagging fly balls. Go to the bullpen, 
throw a simulated uh, you know, mental inning where you work on your routine. So that can be extremely, extremely valuable. But again, I've thrown a lot of uh, different factors at you guys. The point is just scan through that list and have some sort of awareness when your velo is all over the place. Like what are some of the things that maybe can reel back in and control a little bit more? And certainly the answer to this is not to freak out, not to think I've undone the last three years of work. Uh, my velo's down, I'm screwed, I'm not gonna get drafted, I'm gonna get released, I'm gonna get cut, I'm not gonna make my team. That's not the right mentality to go into it with. It's to go into it from more of a objective mentality, zoom out a little bit and then think, what can I do logically to address these different variables moving forward? Um, there's a lot of reasons, fluctuations is normal, don't freak out. If you're having any issues, um, you know, that is where honestly having a coach is so valuable because they're there to problem solve when, th when things aren't going right. You don't necessarily need a coach when things are going great. You don't necessarily need a cheerleader. You need a coach to be in your corner and be able to see the context in the big picture when things are not going your way. And that's ultimately, I, I feel, the main value to what we're able to do. Um, so take these things into consideration. Hopefully you guys got some value out of this video. Drop a comment down below if you have anything to add. And if you have any suggestions for future topics, future content, uh, let me know. And again, you guys can always email us at contact at if you need anything. I will see you guys in the next video. Thanks again for watching.